Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I think we're, are we rolling up there, Caden? Good to go. Morning to all of you at home as well. Uh, welcome to Granite Lake Community Church. And uh, we're looking for shark snacks. Uh, Andy, uh, any, uh, any idea? We don't have any shark snacks. I, 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 I'm, I'm drawing blanks on shark snacks. Just don't have them. Or Lava Girl snacks. I'm not sure which. Oh, Shark Boy. <laughs> uh, welcome to Granite Lake Community Church. Um, God bless you. Uh, today uh, is another day we have an opportunity just to, to one, fellowship together, even if we're at a little bit of a distance. And those of you at home, uh, fellowshipping with you as well. We think about you and pray for you all the time. So uh, before we stand and worship, let's pray and get ready for that, okay? <laughs> Father, we... Uh, are grateful for who you are, uh, Lord, for how much you love us and care for us and continue to pursue us each and every day, Father, each and every day despite uh, our decisions or what we might do that causes a little bit of a gap between us or a distance between us, that, Father, you continue to knock on the door of our hearts and ask us to let you back in. Uh, Lord, thank you for pursuing, uh, constantly pursuing us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the day that you give before us to be able to worship who you are and that, God, as we stand and worship you, may uh, our hearts as well as our minds be moved by the sounds of the words and the music uh, to get our eyes on you. That God, when we open up your word, our heart would be pliable and moldable, uh, open to the work of your word, God. So we thank you, God, for all this that we have to praise you for. The many blessings, even though it's hard sometimes to see them or to count them. Uh, Father, when we do take the time to be still and the time to just say, okay, here's all the things that you've blessed me with, we can be overwhelmed with how much you bless us with. So, Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing. We got a whole orchestra right here.
raked our entire backyard yesterday and I can hardly lift my arms. So, um, we're, uh, we're struggling up here, ne Jesus. needless to say. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Every song we get through, we're like, know, okay, just, we can do this. <laughs> we can do this. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God is good. You know, I've had a few things in the last few weeks where I've had to, like, really step back and, like, okay, I'm going to trust God through this. I'm just going to trust God. He knows what's around the corner, and, you know, um, he does. He knows what's good for us. He, know, he knows the best plan for us, and we have our plans all laid out. But uh, sometimes God says to just stop and change your plans and let him take you where he wants you to go. And, um, and that's kind of what we need this morning. I just need God to change my plans for what I have for you guys. And I need God to come through me and you need God to come through you. It's not just a one-person deal here. I feel like sometimes we're up here and we're like kind of stumbling along and you guys are looking at us like, okay, what's coming next? But I'm telling you right now, God is coming next. Amen? Amen? <laughs> if I can remember how this song goes, we'll be really good. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into 
Are there any announcements? Any? No, this is, you guys are rock stars. That's the big <laughs> announcement. Come on. Oh, God is good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All the time. is to see God take action when we've waited. Amen? 
we're not good at waiting. We live in a very instant world. We live in a world that gives us what we want at the touch of our fingertips. You can hop on Amazon and you can find the thing you want and you can order it and it can be your house in a day. That's crazy. Crazy. We very seldom take the time to just let God come to us and show us what he needs to show us or show us what he wants to show us. Thank you, Father God, so much for your patience with us. God, help us, Lord, to just seek you first today, God. Seek you first, the kingdom of God. And all these other things will be added unto it, God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking over in areas of our lives, God, that we cannot even fathom to know. To know how to handle things, God. Thank you for your, thank you for your faithfulness and your perseverance toward us, God. Sometimes his voice comes and it's like a it's like a sweet, gentle whisper in our ears, and sometimes it's like a smack against the head. We need God. We need you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We need you, Lord. Shout your praise, our hearts. 
hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
way too much fun playing Simon Says there for a little while, man. Should we do it again? Anybody want to play? Come on along. Let's just do it. <laughs> You're so great. It's so good. All right, hey, uh, we're gonna, we can dismiss the kids right now. I'll pray over them as they head out, okay? Father, we, uh, again, as we sang that last song, you are uh, always in pursuit of us. And when we really turn away from that which drags us down and look fully into your face, everything else dims. So God, today as we uh, uh, ask your blessing upon the kids and their families, it was really glorious. I, I walked around, talked to a few folks and just said, look at all the kids. It was so cool. Lord, thank you for the blessing of our children. And as they go downstairs, bless them and their time together with their teachers and let them just continue to grow up in you, Father. And Lord, as we get ready to open up your word, would you speak to us with the power that only your word has to change us, to mold us, and to make us more and more like you each and every day. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, um, <laughs> I, get, I don't know if you, all of you got one of these as you came in, but this is, these are the scriptures that I'm going to be looking at, and you, it's a fill in the blank. When I'm um, kind of struggling, I kind of fall back onto my teaching stuff and say, okay, what would be good to do? Maybe some fill-in-the-blank stuff. So that's what we have. If you don't have one, I know that uh, uh, they're in the back. So um, if you have a pen, how many of you brought your Bible? Raise up your Bible if you have it. A few of you. A few of you came to school without your equipment. I'm, I'm a little ashamed about that, students, some of the students. Um, so this past, on Friday, uh, when I left campus, when I walked outside, it was just beautiful outside. And it was one of those days, yesterday was as well. Yet, uh, on Friday, as I walked outside, I was reminded of it's almost baseball season. And I get excited when I think about baseball season starting up. It smelled like baseball. I wanted to get a rake in my hand and go rake on the, on the infield and do some work on, on, the, on the infield grass and stuff. And it was just really, really cool. Uh, to think about either playing or coaching. And um, I've told this story to you before, but I'm going to tell it again because it cracks me up and it applies to what we're going to talk about today. Okay? Uh, kind of along the lines of counting the cost. When I came to play baseball at LC a long, 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 long time ago in the 70s, wow, man, 76, I came up to play baseball and met some beautiful young lady that I was not smart enough to grab on and hold on to at that moment. But, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that fall I was playing for a guy by the name of Ed Sheff that some of you might know. Either you've watched him coach or you've heard about him or, or something along those lines. And, and he was brand new to LCSC. Uh, the guy that recruited me had retired, left, and Ed took his place. And so I didn't know Coach Sheff from anybody, right? And I came from a junior college that had a particular um, philosophy of pitching that if you ever got ahead of the hitter, like uh, two strikes on him, one ball, two strikes, no balls, two, two strikes, and that was that um, you fished, you got him to fish, okay, you threw a slider away or a curveball away, all righty? Well, Ed's philosophy, and the two catchers that came with him from Longview, uh, Lower Columbia, knew Ed's philosophy. Coach Chef's philosophy is whenever you got ahead of somebody, you threw the ball up and in on him. In other words, you buzzed their chin, and if you hit him, that's okay. <laughs> It's a Christian message today, okay? <laughs> um, so I, I got ahead of this here. It was just a fall baseball game against Gonzaga, and no uniforms, no referees, you know, and, or no umpires. And so we, we were just doing what I thought was just kind of practicing and training. And so I, I'm on the mound, and there's a guy on second base. He hit a single and then stole second base. And he, so he's on second base. And I'm, I'm ahead of the hitter. I, got, I have one ball and two strikes on him. And the, the catcher gave me the sign which I had come to know meant this, one down, thumb up. Andy, what's that mean? Buzz them, right up under their chin. And if you hit them, that's okay. So I got that signal, and I looked at him like this, and I, I looked back at this guy, and he gave me the one like this, and I went, mm-mm. -mm. I wasn't ready for that. I, I mean, I haven't really practiced throwing up and in and becoming comfortable with throwing up and in on somebody. And... Um, he went down again, and I went, uh-uh, and I did one of these, which means give me a different sign, and this is one more or two more, okay? 
And so he finally gave me the three away, which meant slider away. So he shifted out there. I reared, checked my runner, reared back, threw a slider. It went in the dirt way outside, got past the catcher, went all the way back to the backstop. So I run in, and because the guy on second's running and rounding third, I go to the plate to cover just to keep, to keep this guy from thinking about coming home. And Sheldon Ireland was the pitcher, I mean the catcher. And he just buzzed one back at me, and it, was, and it hurt. And, and the message was, don't ever shake me off again. Okay? I thought, okay, lesson learned. Okay? I hadn't really begun the real lesson yet. <laughs> and that is that I'm standing on home plate. I turn around, and I'm not even one step off of home plate. And I get introduced to the real Ed Chef. And he came up, and he chested me like with his arm, like, with his fist like that, just <laughs> boom. And he gave me the most kindest, gentlest message that I think I've ever heard. Bill, I love you. You're the greatest. Just wish, you know, no, there was every other word was a four-letter word. Um, he called me all kinds of names and was just drilling on my chest. By the time he was done with me, which the last message was, don't you ever shake Sheldon off again. By the time he was done, remember, I had taken one step back to the mound from home plate. By the time he left, I was, behind, I was back behind home plate by two solid steps. He just kept drilling on me like this, back and like this. And, and um, I said, oh, golly, I didn't know what to say. But I'm telling you, my legs, every ounce of energy, strength was gone. And I wobbled back to the mound. And um, it was in that moment when I said, what am I in for? What is this? And I went home that night after it was, I got out of the inning, amazingly enough, but I went home that night and just I talked to my roommate and I just said, I, 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 I'm not sure what this is all about. I, this is different than what I'm used to. Okay? My high school coach wasn't that intense. The junior college coach wasn't that intense. Um, I had heard stories about Ed. Ed was a football player, got drafted out of uh, uh, Lewis and Clark College in Portland uh, for football by the Oakland Raiders. Now I understood why he was like he was. He was a Raider man. Yeah. <laughs> He was a Raider man. He was so intense. So I kind of wrestled with things, thinking, oh, man, I, I, I'm, in, I, I'm here. I've signed a, a, a small scholarship, so I, I have to endure this. But it was along those lines that I started thinking, man, I have to choose to stay in this and learn from it. So I chose to stay. That was a long year to get used to someone who had his own way of being an encourager but was more of a just in your face. And I learned after I uh, was done playing for him and in coaching for him was that he would come out and he would specifically pick out two or three people and he would just pelt them in them, in their faces constantly, just testing, okay, wanting to see are you really willing to hang with us? Do you really have what it takes to stay in this program? That's why he would send people, uh, at, the, at that time, he hadn't figured out to have, force us to run up the hill, the Lewiston Hill. Okay? He did that after I left, thank, thankfully. But we used to have to go down 11th Ave, all the way up 21st Street, way up onto Bryden, come around, and come back down. That was the run he would send us on. The message that I, I learned from that after staying two years, I absolutely loved playing for Coach Chef. Absolutely loved playing for him after um, that first year of trying to figure out Man, this is intense. This is tough. I wonder if I have what it takes to get through this. I wonder if I can make it through this. And uh, what I learned is I did. I did have it. did have what it took to stay in there and to get into it. And I only lost one game in two years, uh, which I'm really proud of. Okay? But I learned how to hear what Ed said, okay? not how he said it. And that takes a while for a guy like Coach Chef to learn how he, what he says and not pay attention to how he says it. And there were times when he, he, would, he would pick on me, he would pick on all, all, every, every player that was there, and, and mostly it was just saying, are you really, really sure you can be with me in this program? The greatest thing he ever said to me was, Billy, that was magical. And that was after I had shut out University of uh, Northern Arizona. And little Eddie Orozzati was another catcher. I had 17 strikeouts and shut them out. And he came up afterwards. And I remember I didn't shake my, I didn't wash my hand for a while. Because Chef shook my hand and said, that was magical, Billy. And I thought, wow, I'm not washing this thing, man. Because that was, you don't hear that ever from, from this guy. Um, 
But it was because I made that night after that whole in fall baseball experience that I went back to my roomie and, and spent the next couple of days just thinking, am I going to do this? And I made this, the conscious decision to say, yes, you're not scaring me away. I am going to stick here. I'm going to dig in, and I'm going to stay here and, and endure this. And, and it wasn't an enduring of it that I learned. It was an incredible passion. And on the, on the end of that, and I don't think Ed would ever say that it was a joy, but I'm going to tell you it was a joy to play for Ed Chef. I love telling people stories. I've got a ton of them about a young 27, 28-year-old Ed Chef. And I absolutely love playing for him. Um, how does that fit with what we're talking about today? Okay. I'm going to talk about an aspect that all of us have to do, and that is choosing to grow up in Christ. As a disciple of Jesus, we are called to make decisions every day, choosing either to grow up in him or to be apathetic towards him and regress and fall back. Great thing about that uh, song, the last song that the worship team sang, is that, that when we turn our eyes upon Jesus, that implies something. That implies that we turn away from something. And for all of us as Christians, we turn away from our sin. We turn away from the, the musty, dingy world of negativity and sin and place our eyes on Jesus. When we do that, it's incredible how quickly the things of this world grow strangely dim. Isn't that a sweet sound? Can you all hear that? That is such a sweet sound. What a beautiful little girl. This one here and that one there are both beautiful. Have you seen them all? There's another little one. Is, is she still up here? <laughs> both of them are smiling. No, she's downstairs. <laughs> that sound is good. Speaking of that, I'd appreciate your prayers for Johanna, and I'll probably, if I can remember to do this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to pray right now. Just prayers, prayers of thankfulness for this noise, and then prayers for our daughter Johanna, who is due any time uh, with our fifth grandchild. So I'm going to pray real quick, okay? Father God, thank you for the sounds of little critters, the sound that just is uh, soothing to the heart and soul. Thank you, God, for the gift of these kids, these beautiful little ones. And I do lift up our daughter, Johanna, and Mike and their family. I, I pray for Eloise, the little gal you've been knitting together and getting stronger and stronger. Pray for Johanna's health, her strength. I pray for Mike and his ability to continue to uphold that family. And Father, you bring Eloise into this world in the timing of yours and that she comes in fully strong and uh, uh, ready to go into this world. Father, we thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you're going to have to remind me where I was at, because that was pretty good. Anybody remember? Yeah, you do. You have to choose to help me right now, man. <laughs> no, you have to choose to, to grow up as a disciple of Christ. That's what we're called to. We don't have to, okay? God loves it when we choose to grow up in him, to come to know him more, to open up his word and let it saturate our minds, especially with everything that goes on in the world. From the time that these scriptures were penned and before that, that the world was filled with stuff that drew us away from our Savior. And he calls on us to say, just turn back, turn your face back to me. Choose to do that. Choose to do that. So that when we do that, choosing to grow in Christ, we demonstrate, I love this quote, and I read it this past weekend, and that is the artful strength of submission. The artful strength of submission to our God and what he has in store for us. That is a phenomenal concept, the artful strength of, sub of submission. Uh, Michelangelo, um, I don't know if many of you are real familiar with his work, but it's phenomenal. Most of us have probably seen David. Okay? I'm going to talk about David later on and that sculpture. But Michael would search. Michelangelo would go out and search for marble. And he would search and search and search for the right kind, just pursuing the right kind of stone, the type of stone that would be able to handle his tool work, that would be responsive to his carving, that would respond to how his vision for that marble. Because he would always start in the middle and work his way out in a stone. And he always had a vision for where it was going to go. And it was really important that he found stones of marble that would respond to his tools and to his work and to his vision. He also had to find the kind of stone that was not only pliable, 
to his carving tools, but strong enough to withstand the work. And that is the choice part for you and I. That is the part that says, uh, work on me, God. And then he starts to work, and it's like, well, that's not really what I thought you were going to do. That's not what I thought you might be doing. And that strength says, okay, I need to continue to have the strength to submit to my God and his work, his vision for me, so that we are strong enough to hold together in the midst of whatever might be going on. And that always comes with being able to, and willing to choose to turn my eyes upon our Savior and away from that that draws us away from him. That is an incredible aspect of our life with Christ. So if you have this little handout you, and you have a pen, I'm going to give you some stuff to fill out. We're going to go with Ephesians chapter 3. Okay? And as you get ready for verse 14 is where I'm going to um, start. I'm going to read three words and I'm going to go back into that passage. Okay? Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to talk about the choice, the choices that we have to grow up in our Savior Jesus Christ as a disciple. The first three words in this passage, chapter 3, verse 14, says, For this reason. For what reason? For this reason is all that passes before that verse, from 1 to 13. I'm going to start in verse 8, just to kind of bring us up to this. Okay, verse 8 says, To me, meaning Paul, the very least of all saints, this grace that he is talking about the previous two chapters, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light that which is, which is the administration of the mystery for all ages has been hidden in God, who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. He's telling this group of believers, he's telling us not to lose heart, not to grow too weary, rely upon the strength of the Holy Spirit to give us the strength to be able to endure, to get through. Don't lose heart at tribulations that are going on amongst us. And then he says this, and this is Paul's prayer for us, and this church in, in, in Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. There's some powerful things that we're going to unpack in this passage. Okay? And this first aspect says that the, the core of, of, of Paul's prayer for you and I in this church in Ephesians, is this, in Ephesus, is this. Paul's prayer is to fully experience the life of Christ. And one, that you and I, or that we, would live under, with and under his power. Okay? On my own, I'm not going to make it. On my own, I can't get through it. I don't know that I made it with Ed Sheff for that first fall without good teammates. I wouldn't have made it. On my own, I would have struggled. That's why he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit so that you and I would live with and under his power, with him and always under that artful strength of submission to his lead and what he wants in our life. The second part, that our life would be a dwelling place for Christ. I want to let that sink on you for a little bit. Your life, my life, that when we experience that life in Christ, what we are doing, living under and with his power, that our life becomes a dwelling place. Think about that right now. That your life, your very being, is a dwelling place for Christ to take up residence, to move in, to move into. When Jennifer and I moved over from Portland to here, 
We had three of the largest U-Hauls they had. And we moved into an empty home and made it ours. We've changed bathrooms. We opened up a floor to create an internal staircase. We've created bedrooms and, and walls and, and all kinds of work in there to make it our place. Jesus, when he moves in, when we allow him in, wants to take up this dwelling residence in which he says, I love your house, but I think I'll do this over here. I think I'll do this over here. And most of the time we're kind of like, okay, I can live with that part. But then all of a sudden he starts banging open some walls. It's like, huh. I don't know that I really was ready for that move. Don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm on that. But in order to have that gracious, incredible experience of the joys and blessings of our God, that is the artful strength of submission to his design, his work, his chipping away at all the rough junk that is our flesh, the things that get in his way. And he does this that we would know his love and his ability to empower us to love others that are difficult to love. That we would see others before others' needs before we attend to ours. Not that we're going to deprave ourselves or you know, degrade ourselves, but we really start to look at others' needs before ourself. Scripture's packed. That's the essence of the gospel, that we would live for others. And Jesus is our model over and over and over in his life, all the way up to the cross, was all about saving the world, saving everybody else at his expense. That we would know that kind of love and that we would be filled up with, and that, the last part of verse 19 says that you and I, when we do all these things, would be filled up with all the fullness of God. Let that sit on you for a second, that we could be filled up with all the fullness of our God. That blows me away to think about, because, mainly because I know my flesh. I know the dwelling place that, that he has access to, and I don't always like him toying with it. But when I allow him, I experience more and more of the fullness of God. When I practice that artful strength of submission and choose to grow up in him, and that last one is that, that you and I, that we would choose to grow in Christ today, Tomorrow, this next week, next month, next year, that we would continue to choose to grow up to him and in his power and in his strength. Choosing to grow up in Christ. I'm going to read verses 14 through 16 here real quick. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man. What, what he's telling us there is that Paul acknowledges where this all begins. It begins on our knees. Not in arrogance and pride and haughtiness, but in a bowed submission to our God and Savior. That's where it begins. That's where our dis life as a disciple begins, that we recognize that, God, I am nothing without you. And you save me out of the depths of hell. When we start our day like that, we have no place to go but where? Straight up with our God. His empowerment recognizes that we are on our knees, that we submit to him, and his mystery is made clear for us, that those who choose to submit and follow Christ, to know his word, to be in his word, that God's promise to us is to grow us up, to give us strength, to endure whatever might come our way. So how do we grow? Real growth, it says in that next little passage that's empty, it says real growth requires purposeful effort. Real growth requires purposeful effort. Any kind of growth in our life without purposeful and an intentional working on it won't be achieved. God, when we gave our life to Christ, we were saved. Okay? made whole at that moment because of the work of Christ. But from that moment on, he is busy working out our life as his disciple, that we would be engaged with choosing him every day in a purposeful kind of effort. And what's funny about our God is, is, is uh, it doesn't matter what's going on, he is always aware of it. There's, a lot, there's plenty in, in, in what's going on, not just in this world right now, but in the universe 
and the galaxies that are all over the place that he's orchestrating. He's got plenty of stuff to be busy with, yet he knows what's going on in your life. Yesterday, I am looking for transcripts, my transcripts from Lewis Clark State College and my transcripts from Central Washington, trying to find them. I, just seen, I had just seen them about three or four months ago. I know I had them. I put them, uh, made a PDF and put them somewhere in my laptop, and I could not find them. I'm searching everywhere for these things. I had printed them. I, didn't, I could not find them. And I'm getting frustrated. Anybody ever get frustrated? We're really Christian-like when we get frustrated, right? And, um, and I didn't know where these were at. I just, you know, one of those moments, yeah, sure, okay, God. Just when I really want these things, I can't find them, right? Murphy's Law, when I don't look for them, I'll find them. But I said, okay, I'm going to go down to campus, to my office. I'm bound to be there. Maybe something will trigger. I'll go down there and find them. So I go down, and I'm, I plug in my laptop, and I'm searching again. I'm entering all kinds of words to try to find these transcripts. And, uh, <laughs> and I just said this brief little thing. And I'm looking on my table here, and there's another uh, uh, file cabinet that's on this side. And I just said, Lord, you know, if I'm supposed to find these things for this app, okay, if I'm supposed to find these things, then I, I, you'll, you'll help. And I, I went to just move a roll of masking tape. There they were. There they were. <laughs> Plain as tape. And, and you know, I, I, I just kind of went, oh, I stopped and I prayed, thanks. Our God is so busy taking care of everything. And at the same time, his omni omniscience places him with me as well. Even something stupid and silly, like a couple of transcripts to go into an app. And I was blown away with that. I went home and, and I was excited to tell somebody Jennifer and Marceline were still out running around, you know, and I had Tashina there, and I said, Sheena, wait till, you, wait till I tell you the story. And I told her the exact story that I just told you, and she went, wow, those are goosebumps. I said, yeah, our God in the middle of everything knows what's going on in our life, knows what we need, and then at the same time knows, here, Bill. <laughs> and he smiled about it. I, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at that kind of... God. I was not purposeful in my effort other than to just say this kind of lame prayer. God, if I'm not supposed to find these things, okay, but if not, pff, oh, okay, thank you. Incredible. Real growth requires purposeful effort. Every day that Ed Chef made us run, which was a lot, a lot, every time he made us run, it was an effort to do until friends that I've, I've mentioned this good friend of mine, Glenn Johnson, a number of times here, and another gentleman by the name of Greg Banger. We became very good friends, and we fell in love with running. Wouldn't have fallen in love with running without somebody coming alongside me, without somebody running with me. That's us as Christians, that we come alongside people. When we come across somebody that may not be a believer, and they're struggling, and they, yet they reach out to you, or you come alongside them, that may be all they need to understand or come to know the incredibly powerful love of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Part of Scripture tells us that the enemy, like a lion, prowls about and roars looking for someone to devour. The enemy loves it when we're alone. The enemy loves it when we kind of pull away from uh, our God and fellowship or our disciples, uh, life as a disciple. He loves it because we're at greater risk. Same thing in here, in that we have to have purposeful effort to be in, our, in the Word, which is the best fellowship tool, but also we're, uh, purposeful efforts to be with one another, especially in the midst of what we're in, involved with today. Philippians 2.12. Turn back just a, put, a little bit, and we'll come back to, uh, we'll come back to uh, Ephesians. Turn up to Philippians chapter 2, and we'll fill in these next blanks here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. This is, if you don't have this underlined, we should. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That should be bolded, highlighted, yellowed, anything that you have to draw that in. And draw our attention to it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. What I read in here is that this, our life as a Christian is a serious and joy-filled work. It is a serious and joy-filled work. To follow that up in, in this next little uh, fill in the blank there, it says, my daily choices have eternal consequences. My daily choices have eternal consequences. I, I hear him crying, doggone it. <laughs> we engage in everyday life to make choices to grow or choices to distance, choices to come alongside, choices to pull away, choices to use love language or hate language. Each of those has an eternal action or result attached to it. And this is the key on this. The next one says, His power and strength in my life allow me to impact the world in a positive way. His power and strength in my life result in my life being an impact for Him. Fear and trembling. <laughs> that tells me that growth is a serious business. Growth is a serious yet joy-filled business with our relationship with Jesus. The more we discipline and allow him to dwell and move in more and more in our life, the more we use that artful strength of submission, the more we experience the fullness of our God, that we can stand firm with and for him and under his leading. That's a powerful aspect in our life with Christ, something that is important for us to constantly keep in mind. This next one on choosing how to grow, it says, how we grow. I'm going to write, ask you to write this word, collaboration, and capitalize labor. Capitalize labor, collaboration, L-A-B-O-R. What that tells me, when we collaborate with the Holy Spirit, when we cooperate with him, there's an aspect of us actually doing some of the work. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Exercise it. Do something that allows you to stretch the envelope of your life, of your spiritual life. Sometimes that's simply praying. You're probably not like me in that sometimes Jennifer will say, well, maybe we should pray. <laughs> and part of me says, I don't want to pray right now. I really don't want to pray right now. And that stubborn two-year-old punk has to be disciplined. And it's basically just submitting and saying, go ahead, Jennifer, pray. And you know, it's always good to allow someone to pray with and for you. It's always good for you and I to come in and speak and pray with someone when they need it. We all need it at different times, and it's important that we understand how to do that. So when we do this co-laboring co with our God, uh, it says here, change. The next thing says change. It says change. I'm called to change my pilot, the autopilot in my life, to allow the Holy Spirit to become more active in leading me where I'm going to go. I'm going to ask you, as it says here, Proverbs chapter 4. Real quickly, turn, turn back to chapter 4, and while you're looking for that, I'm going to pull my notes, if you don't mind. Proverbs 4, verses 20 to 27. This is another powerful passage in Scripture that allows us to see what happens when we let God speak to us. Verse 20, chapter 4. My son, give attention to my words. In other words, pay attention to what his word says. It's hard for us to give attention to the words if we don't spend time in it. Give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their whole body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put devious lips far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you, and watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. All of our life 
as a disciple is about discovering what God's will is for us, to follow his plan, not mine. And that's a tough balance because we, we wrestle with, do I take this step, God? Should I take this step? And as we take that step, either it's wide open and we, pers- and we continue in it, uh, giving us the idea that, okay, maybe that's confirmation that God wanted me to go this direction, whatever that might be. And if, it has, if it's thwarted, if it's interfered with, and we get the, re- the, the message that, okay, God, you don't want me to go there. In my time here with, uh, with Jennifer and I for 27 years, I've applied to a couple of jobs way over, over in Oregon. And um, one of them we got all the way to the interview status. And we interviewed. And all, every time it was like, God, if this is your will, please make it so. If not, slam the door shut. Slam the door shut. And when we get the letter that says, thank you, but we've gone another direction. Confirmation that God said, oh, I've just shut your door. Not now. That's sometimes hard to hear. But as the more I give attention to his words and incline my ear to his sayings, The more I let my eyes dwell upon him, the more I practice the artful strength of submission, the more I'm able to hear those answers of no, not yet, or yes, now. Those are important things for us that we choose to co-labor and we change the autopilot, which is the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to help us lead our life. It's tough. That next one, number two, says this. Let his truth transform you or me. Let his truth transform me. And I'm going to read all of Romans 12, one of my favorite passages, because it applies here. It says, Matthew Matthew 4 says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on on the very word of God. 12, 1 and 2. Of Romans, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I love the fact that I've got mine circled. Mercies is plural. (laughs) It's not just one mercy. My life needs tons of mercies. Mercies is that aspect of not getting what I really deserve. Grace is getting something that I do not deserve. I deserve other things that are not positive because of my behavior, my sin. All of us as sinful people struggle with that. But because of the mercies of God how much he loves us. He says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Let his truth transform you. And that's his word. Power of prayer is awesome reading his word and letting it seek into those prayers and reading passages as if they were prayers is powerful because it serves to transform us and to give us that aspect that God loves you beyond measure and wants what's best for you. Choose to grow up in his life and in his power. Last part of uh, 16 through 13 of Ephesians. Okay, The last part of that that we read earlier. I'm going to read verses 16 through 19. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. That first fill in the blank is that when we draw near to Christ, when we choose to have that artful submission to him, we will be strengthened by his power. Okay? I will be strengthened by his power in the depths of my soul that allows me to endure whatever comes our way. I don't know what that is what this next year has in store for us, what tomorrow does or what next week does. But if he's my strengthening source, the more I submit to him, the more I draw near to his truth and let his words and incline my ear to his powerful words, I am strengthened by his power. When I do that as well, when I incline my ear, when I draw near to him, when I allow his word to transform me, that second one says Christ will dwell in my heart, that Christ will dwell there. He doesn't just accompany 
He wants to come in and take over. He wants to come in and make you such a strong Christian who loves others well, who places the needs of others before ourselves. Christ will dwell in my heart. And here's the heart, uh, I think that, that that last part about that will be filled up with the fullness, that we'll be able to comprehend and experience his love. The breadth, the height, the depth of his love for us. And we will be filled up with awe, filled to all the fullness of God. A um, number of years ago, I was blessed to go speak at a conference, and I drove over to Banff. And Banff is an incredibly beautiful, I mean, beautiful location. Very similar to over in the Wallowa Lake, Wallowa Lake area. I mean, just un unfathomable how beautiful it is. And I remember standing there looking at the Canadian Rockies in this lake, I think it was Lake Louise, and just in, in, in awe of God just going, and there it was. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I mentioned David the, uh, earlier in this. When Jennifer and I were in, in uh, Italy, we went to this place called the Academia. Uh, and in it, we knew David was in there. And it's just this little stucco, two-story uh, art museum. It's got spray paint all on the outside. And it's just like, wow, why would they? I mean, David and all these other works of art are in there. It's, why would they let that happen? Well, we go in there, and, and here are all these incredible sculptures all over the place of students. Phenomenal sculptures. And we take this turn, and we, uh, as we make a turn, there's, there are six unfinished pieces of sculpting of Michelangelo's. And one of them is called Atlas. And that, um, again, I mentioned earlier that when Michelangelo would work, he would work from the middle of the stone out to carve. And this Atlas guy, you could see part of his leg right here, and you, this part of his hand, and then it kind of and it kind of moves into the stone. That's about all you can see. And you can see what he's doing is trying to pull this guy out to hold up the, the world. You can see it right there. And it's like he's trying to get out. Okay? We're, I'm, I'm blown away by, by this. And we make another corner, and there's David standing down at, the, down at the end of this hallway. And it was just like a moment of going, whoa. I've read about him. I've seen pictures of it. Jennifer is in awe the artist that she is and the sculptor that she is, that she goes walking down right up to it. And I kind of hesitated, man. I kind of thought, I don't think I want to get too close to this thing yet. And it was phenomenal to see that, to be in awe of majestic mountains, to be in awe of kids and children, to be in awe of you all when we serve together, when we walk together, when we think of others' needs before myself, ourselves. I'm in awe of that because that is Christ working in you, Christ working in us so that our witness out there is characterized by love and good deeds for others. Our God wants to make sure we understand that last little piece there. It says, caution, keep it simple. Religion is going to complicate it. Religion will complicate the life of a disciple. It is a simple process of, of the artful submission, the artful strength of submission, and choosing each day to grow and allow it, because he's going to do the work. <laughs> if we can get out of the way, he will do the work for us. And it's amazing when that takes place, because our depth, our walk, our heart, gains capacity that you never thought possible because he is busy. His Holy Spirit comes in and takes over powerfully. That's everyday decisions that we have. Making a decision right now, outstanding. But we need to make those decisions tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, each and every day to decide to grow up and allow him to dwell in our life and to grow us up. Not easy to grow up. Not easy to grow up because it takes some effort. But that little bit of effort is magnified by the power of the Holy Spirit. So give him a little bit of effort effort this, this day, this week, this month, this coming month, and see what he does with that. Amen? Let's pray. God, again, thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, God, that you speak to us through your truth. And God, as we read today, the opportunities to 
that you put before us to choose to grow up, to choose to lean our ear towards your sayings, to think about them, to dwell upon them, and allow your Holy Spirit to move in more and more, to occupy more and more space in our being. Father, this world needs people who love well. It always has. Your example to us was always about loving others well and sacrificing for their needs. Why? Because you love us. Father, help us to love well. Help us to leave this building more in tune with who you are, more understanding of what we are as a disciple of Christ, and that, God, that your Holy Spirit would help us and transform us and make us more and more like you. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a really good day today and a good week.